Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Stuart Corbridge. I'm the Deputy Director and Provost here at LSE, and it's a very great pleasure to be able to introduce this session this afternoon. Firstly, on behalf of LSE, I would like to thank the Systemic Risk Centre and the Centre for the Philosophy of the Natural and Social Sciences for organising this conference. I offer my sincere thanks also to the ESRC, which supports a good deal of research at the school, including climate change, economic performance, macroeconomics, and systemic risk. When I started in senior management at the school three and a half years ago, my boss was Sir Howard Davis, who of course was the first head of the Financial Services Authority in the UK. Among many other notable ties between the LSE faculty and our alumni and the financial world, I might mention Janet Yellen, uh, the new chair of the Federal Reserve who started her academic career here with us. Mervyn King, of course. Minouche Shafiq, who was appointed this week to be a deputy governor at the Bank of England, who will return to London from Washington and the IMF. Charlie Bean, and one of our participants today, uh, Charles Goodhart. Mm -hmm. The Systemic Risk Center has picked up this baton, and we fully expect it over the next few years to consolidate its growing reputation for being the center on risk, especially financial risk, in the academic world, and to act in the best LSE tradition of linking scholarly researchers with policymakers, both informing and learning from them. It's also very pleasing for me to see that CPNSS is a co-sponsor of the conference and is itself continuing a long tradition of philosophy at LSE being very much linked to public policy and the world outside the academy. Secondly, and very importantly, I want to say that it is a great honor for the school to host our keynote speaker in this session, Mr. Haru Haruhiko Kuroda. Mr. Kuroda studied at the universities of Tokyo and Oxford and became in March 2013 the 31st governor of the Bank of Japan. Governor Kuroda previously had a long, very distinguished career as the eighth president of the Asian Development Bank, where he was in post from 2005 to 2013, and before that served both as a special advisor to the cabinet of the government of Japan and as a senior vice president in the Ministry of Finance. Governor Kuroda was nominated in 2013 by the incoming government of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, and already in his time in office, he has been associated, of course, with a much stronger commitment than hitherto in Japan to monetary easing, which perhaps inevitably has also meant some weakening in the strength of the yen. Everyone in this room is looking forward to hearing from Governor Kuroda. The extraordinary growth of the Japanese economy post-1945, as well as the deflation that has beset the country in more recent years, are of interest to all economists and policymakers, and I think to members of the public much more widely. There's a lot for us all to learn. Governor Kuroda, we're delighted and honored that you are with us at LSE today. And we look forward first to hearing your speech and then to the discussion that will follow between you and Dr. John Danielson and then with the audience more generally. Welcome to LSE. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, it is uh, indeed my honor to be given the opportunity today to speak at the conference hosted by the London School of Economics and Political Science. As you may know, just one year has passed since I became governor of the Bank of Japan on March uh, 20th, 2013. In short, this past one year was one marked by the challenge of overcoming deflation. The world 
the word deflation might remind you of the price decline associated with rapid contraction of the economy during the Great Depression of the 1930s. Some might even look back to the much earlier episode of the downward trend in prices for more than 20 years that the United Kingdom experienced in the second half of the 19th century. What is deflation actually like? What is deflation? Why a deflation a problem? As I would expect that nobody here has actually experienced those past deflations, you might be able to conceive of answers to these questions, but it could be difficult to have a true sense of the reality of those uh, situations. Therefore, in my speech today, I will talk about Japan's experience of 15 years of deflation and how we are trying to overcome that. Let me first ask you a question. What is the average annual rate of decline in consumer prices in Japan in the past 15 years? The answer is minus 0.3%. Unlike the rapid and substantial price decline during the Great Depression in the 1930s, a feature of Japan's deflation is that an extremely moderate price decline has continued for a long period. The unemployment rate was 5.5% at its worst, and there has been no such scene as jobless people predominating in a town, as was the case in the Great Depression. This is not to say that there weren't any problems simply because the decline in prices was moderate. If we were to regard the price decline during the Great Depression as a fierce and acute symptom, Japan's de deflation has come to show a symptom akin to a chronic lifestyle disease. Once an expectation that prices will fall becomes built in among the public, real interest rates, which are obtained by subtracting expected rates of inflation from nominal interest rates, will increase. Of course, a central bank can cope with such a situation if it can lower nominal interest rates, but in Japan, the policy rate has already, had already been lower to 0.5% in 1995, and there was little room to further reduce nominal interest rates. An increase in real interest rates restrains business fixed investment and household spending, and thus economic activity in Japan remained stagnant. In addition, under deflation, holding cash and deposit becomes a better choice than making investment, an incentive to launch new businesses by taking risks become weakened. In this situation, Japan's economy lost vitality and the growth rate declined. It can be said that a moderate price decline has gradually undermined Japan's economy. Therefore, what we should do to restore the vitality of Japan's economy and let the economy grow in a sustainable manner is to achieve the 2% price stability target and overcome protracted deflation. As I will describe later, to overcome deflation, the Bank of Japan introduced last April quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, or QQE, an unprecedented board monetary easing and has been pursuing this policy today. So as to enhance your understanding of the bank's initiatives to overcome deflation, I will address three questions. First, why has Japan's economy been unable to overcome deflation? Second, how are we trying to get out of deflation? And 
Lastly, how far have we come in the process of overcoming deflation? As I mentioned earlier, deflation has been continuing in Japan since the late 1990s, but the economy has not been in recession during the whole period. Instead, a recovery phase of more than six years from the beginning of 2002 to early 2008 marked the longest post-war economic recovery. Since 1999, to overcome deflation, the Bank of Japan adopted ahead of other central banks various unconventional monetary measures such as the zero interest rate policy, quantitative monetary easing, a commitment to the duration of these policies, and purchases of risk assets. If we had named the commitment to the duration of the zero interest rate policy introduced in 1999 as eye-catching forward-looking, the bank might have received an owner as the inventor of this policy tool. However, during the tailwind in the real economy and considerable efforts by the bank, Japan's economy could not overcome deflation. What was lacking? To state the answer first, what lacked was the central bank's strong and clear commitment to achieve its price stability target and its action to work on inflation expectations through that commitment. To, be to begin with, if we look into the causes of Japan's price decline, various factors have had an effect at each point in time. To name several, there were an adjustment of excess capacity and employment after the bubble bursted in the early 90s, low price import from emerging economies and firms' low price strategies, financial institutions' non-performing loan problems and financial system uneasiness, and an excessive appreciation of the yen. As actual prices declined due to these factors, deflationary expectations that prices will not rise but instead decline were generated among people. Subsequently, even if those factors that induced price declines diminished, once deflationary expectations became entrenched, people would make decisions and take actions on the assumption that prices would not rise. Through this process, deflationary expectations themselves created in a self-fulfilling manner an economy in which prices did not easily rise. Explained by using the jargon on economics, Japan's economy is in a situation in which the Phillips curve, which expresses a negative relationship between inflation and unemployment, has shifted downward due to a decline in people's inflation expectations. Even when the economy is uh, trapped uh, in such a situation, we can raise prices temporarily by rejuvenating economic activity through stimulus, uh, stimulative policies. However, if the Phillips curve remains shifted downward, the economy will eventually return to a deflationary state once economic activity declines over the business cycle. This is why Japan's economy could not overcome deflation after all, despite experiencing an economic expansion several times while deflation was continuing. Having analyzed why protracted deflation occurs, let us turn to the second question. What is required to get out of protracted deflation and achieve the 2% uh, price stability target in a sustainable manner. As a plus, the problem lies in the fact that people have a deflationary sentiment that prices will fall, will continue to fall. We have to dispel such sentiment. 
We have to convince people that a situation in which prices will increase by around 2% every year is nothing special and change the economy to one in which people make decisions and behave based on that assumption. In other words, it is necessary to raise people's expected rate of inflation to 2% and re-anchor them at, the, at that level. The bank had repeatedly implemented various leading edge policies. While a series of such policies stimulated economic activity, they fell short of showing a strong and clear commitment to achieve the price stability target by any means. As a result, these were insufficient to work on inflation expectations and fail to raise them. Therefore, even in the face of a temporary rise in prices, the rise was not sustained and the economy could not get out of deflation for a long period. Let me next take, talk about uh, the Bank of Japan is now, how the Bank of Japan is now trying to raise people's inflation expectations and overcome deflation. It is clear from the results of past policies that deflationary sentiment that has been embedded under protracted deflation cannot be easily dispelled. There have been only a few examples. Looking back, one can immediately think of the US New Deal policy of the 1930s as an episode in which people's inflation expectations substantially rose in a short period of time through policy measures. At the same period in Japan, a similar series of macroeconomic policy measures called Takahashi Economic Policy, named after the finance minister who took the initiative, were implemented. In these policies, an exit from the gold standard enabled foreign exchange rates to adjust in line with actual economic conditions, and macroeconomic policies that combined aggressive fiscal and monetary policies were implemented. By contrast, the powerful monetary tightening by Chairman Volcker of the US Federal Reserve from the end of 1970s to the beginning of the 1980s can be noted as an episode in which inflation expectations were substantially lowered. All these events are associated with the policy authority's strong will to drastically change the economic, economic situation with a bold uh, 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 policy uh, conversion that underpinned such will. Therefore, to combat people's deflationary expectations and to raise their expected rate of inflation, it is necessary to demonstrate the bank's strong resolution and commitment toward overcoming deflation and to implement decisive policy that is sufficient to achieve that goal. We also have to make the conversion of expectations happen under a zero lower bound for nominal interest rates. Taking these points into account, at a monetary policy meeting on April 4 last year, the bank introduced the unprecedented large-scale monetary easing policy of the QQE. It was a policy upon strong commit, strongly committing to achieve the 2% price stability target with a time horizon above, of about two years in mind uh, to increase annually the monetary base by an unprecedented amount of about 60 to 70 trillion yen to underpin the commitment. As a result, the monetary base will be doubled in two years. In addition, aiming to achieve the 2% price stability target, the bank committed to continuing with the QQE as long as it is necessary for maintaining the target in a sustainable manner. The bank clearly committed to achieving the 2% stability target with a time horizon of about two years, and also to continue with the unprecedented large-scale monetary easing of the QQE as long as it is necessary for maintaining the target in a stable manner. 
We considered that such a com combination would raise people's inflation expectations in a forward-looking manner. We also assumed that, as a result, if actual prices start to increase, that would affect inflation expectations in a backward-looking manner as well. And with an increase in the number of people who believe in the bank's commitment, the forward-looking inference would also be strengthened. Let me be more specific about the transmission mechanism of the QQE. Three transmission channels are assumed, containing interest rates and risk premiums through massive asset purchases, portfolio rebalancing, and raising inflation expectations. What I would like to focus in particular is the channel starting from a rise in inflation expectations. As a rise in inflation expectations shifts the Phillips curve upward, at the same level of economic activity, the actual inflation rate will be higher. In addition, a rise in expectation, expected rate of inflation uh, in if nominal interest rate rise uh, uh, rise uh, interest, nominal interest rate rise by less than that will lower real interest rate and stimulate economic activity. That is, if the bank can contain nominal interest rate through massive asset purchases while raising expected rate of inflation, it can lower real interest rate. In the case of the US and, and, and Europe, as inflation expectations are already being anchored at price stability target, they have no choice but to reduce nominal interest rates in order to lower real interest rate. However, in the case of Japan, as inflation expectations have been below the level of the price stability target, there is room for lowering real interest rates through raising inflation expectations. A decline in real interest rates will stimulate uh, businesses, business fixed investment and, 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 and consumption and raise the actual inflation rate by narrowing the output gap. Once prices start to rise, this will further increase, induce a rise in inflation expectations, which in turn work on real interest rates to decline again. In such a manner, a virtuous cycle starting from rising inflation expectations will take hold. So, how far have we come toward the goal of achieving the 2% price stability target and overcoming deflation? To state the conclusion first, Japan's economy has been following a path toward achieving the 2% price stability target as expected, and we are halfway there. The transmission mechanism of the QQE has been functioning as initially intended. According to various surveys and market indicators, we judge that inflation expectations have generally been rising. Due to the bank's massive purchases of government bonds, long-term interest rates have been hovering in a stable manner at low levels. In fact, in the face of a, of a rise in the U.S., long-term interest rates from below 2% to about 3% in relation to uh, uh, Fed uh, tapering uh, uh, discussions of uh, of its, uh, its, uh, its uh, asset uh, purchase program. Uh, Japan's long-term interest rates have been stable and recently at around 0.6%. As a result, real interest rates have been declining. At this stage, uh, negative. Uh, there are also changes in bank behavior. The 
the year-on-year rate of increase in bank lending has gradually accelerated and has been around 2.5%. Lending has increased not only to large farms, but also to small farms, for which the year-on-year -year rate of change has turned positive, suggesting that lending has become widespread to a variety of businesses. Partly reflecting this development in bank lending, the year-on-year -year rate of increase in the money stock has gradually been accelerating, hovering around 4% in recent months. In relation to this, last month, the Bank of Japan expanded the lending facilities to support financial institutions' initiative to increase lending that are similar to the funding for lending of, uh, of the Bank of England. The Bank of Japan will provide funds to financial institutions up to double the amount of their net increase in lending. And like the long-term refinancing operation of the European Central Bank, provide long-term funds. It will provide funds with a four-year fixed rate of 0.1%. While the bank's main engine of its monetary policy is a QQE, these uh, lending facilities are designed to reinforce a transmission mechanism of that policy. We have been taking a stance of doing whatever we can to achieve the 2% price stability target. Partly due to the effect of the QQE, Japan's economy has been growing above its potential growth rate led by domestic demand, with real GDP growth uh, uh, increasing year on year by 1.5% on average in 2013 and by 2.5% measured from fourth quarter to fourth quarter. On the employment front, the unemployment rate has declined to 3.7%, which is close to the structural unemployment rate of around 3.5%. As for the outlook, Japan's economy is expected to continue on a moderate recovery with a virtuous cycle among uh, production income and spending at work. On the price front, the year-on-year -year rate of change in the consumer price index, excluding fresh food, was minus 0.5% as of March last year, turned positive in June, and has been accelerating to mark plus 1.3% this January. It is still lower than that in the United Kingdom, but almost the same level as that in Germany and higher than that in most of the continental European countries. The rate of in increase is likely to be around one and a quarter percent for some time, subsequently returned to the uptrend and is likely to reach around the price stability target of 2% from the end of fiscal 2014 through fiscal 2015. Achieving an inflation rate of more than 1% is in less than a year since the introduction of the QQE was beyond many people's expectations. In fact, according to the ESP forecast survey, which compiles economist uh, forecast, the projection of uh, year-on-year -year rate of growth in the CPI for this January to March quarter, as of March last year, was only plus 0.4 percent. So the uh, economists forecast uh, around uh, 0.4 percent inflation in this quarter, while in reality inflation rate already reached 1.3 percent. While in, we introduced the QQE with confidence in its effect, for many people this development uh, seemed to have been a positive surprise. When something occurs that differs from expectations, people have a strong incentive to change their past views and behavior. Our work to change deflationary expectations that have been entrenched over time as well as people's behavior under such expectations has been progressing as expected. 
with a strong reinforce, uh, reinforcement of an actual rise in the consumer price index. As the consumption tax will be raised to 8% from 5% this April, it is expected that there will be a decline in demand after the tax hike following the front-loaded increase in demand prior to the tax hike. Based on the experience of the economy going into recession when a consumption tax was raised last time in 1997, there was some concern over the outlook for the economy this time as well. However, looking back at 1997, the economy at one point recovered from a plunge following the consumption tax hike, but Japan's financial system instability and an outbreak of the Asian currency crisis subsequently uh, uh, affected and 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 uh, and uh, the the uh, subsequent uh, economic deterioration. By contrast, at present, Japan's financial system has been maintaining stability. And the emerging economies in Asia have become more resilient due partly to an accumulation of foreign reserves and an establishment of safety net. In addition, Japan's employment situation is far more favorable than that in 1997. Taking these points into account, the bank believes that while Japan's economy will temporarily decline immediately after the consumption tax hike, it will continue to grow above its potential growth rate at, as a trend with a virtuous cycle among production income and spending being maintained. As I have mentioned so far, with the QQE steadily exerting its intended effect, Japan's economy has been following a path toward achieving the 2% price stability target as expected. Of course, we are only halfway there and will steadily pursue the QQE. As the economy is associated with upside and downside risks, we will examine them and make adjustment as appropriate in order to achieve the 2% price stability target. By firmly continuing with such policy, I'm com convinced that we can achieve the 2% price stability target and overcome deflation. In the past 15 years, Japan was not sleeping because it wanted to. It was only that even if one person or one firm wanted to take on new challenges, Rewards meeting such challenges could not be ex expected under a macroeconomic environment of persistent deflation. With the QQE and the government various initiatives, we have unlocked this fallacy of composition. Therefore, Japanese farms that, ori that originally were equipped with excellent technologies and human capital have started to take on new initiatives again, and the economy and prices have changed dramatically. We should not let this trend be reversed. To this end, we are making efforts with strong resolution. The day that Japan's economy can contribute more and more to the world economy is at hand. Thank you. Um, the discussant for the governor's talk is my LSE colleague, John Danielson. Uh, John is in the Department of Finance and is a co-director of the Systemic Risk Center. Now, we are very fortunate to have Mr. Korota here in LSE on the one-year anniversary of him becoming the governor of the Bank of Japan. And it does give me a good occasion to study his year in a historical context. However, before I do that, I do need to declare a special interest. Mm. Many years ago, I did spend some time at the Bank of Japan, and I do recall my time there quite fondly. <laughs> However, one thing really does stand out. I have had the 
occasional to lunch in many staff dining rooms of public agencies. None have left me with a desire to return, except the Bank of Japan. And in particular, the excellent spicy curry they did serve, or maybe still do on Thursdays. It's well worthwhile visiting for that. Now, I was recently reading the history of central banking in the 1920s and 1930s mm. and its connections to the Great Depression. History has not treated any of the governors then kindly. Mm. And to my mind, one episode really stands out. In February 1933, at the very height of the Great Depression, the President of the United States asked the Federal, Re Federal Reserve what policies they recommended to fight the Depression. The response of the Federal Reserve was, Mr. President, there is nothing we can do. Mm. When Mr. Kuroda got a similar <laughs> phone call last year, he did step to the plate. Now, there is no good deflation, and the central banks do have tools to fight deflation. When the history of the central bank governors working throughout this crisis will be written in the decades to come, I assume many will be treated badly. Some will be seen as a 21st version of Norman Montague. <laughs> Others, like Mr. Kurot, I suspect, will be seen in a better light. And we do, I think, in Europe, need to spend more time studying recent Japanese history. Because, as Mr. Kuroda's predecessor, mm. Mr. Shirakawa, pointed out right here in LSE two years ago, in so many ways, Japan resembles us 10 years into the future. There are many lessons to be learned, both mistakes to be avoided and correct policy to be followed. Mm. The framing of the Japanese policy as the three arrows is quite useful. Mm. And over the decades, I do suspect that both Japan and Europe will find it equally important to implement the third arrow mm. structural reforms. Mm. However, perhaps a more immediate concern is the first arrow monetary policy mm. and the impact uh, of, uh, and we do have to recognize that the impact of similar monetary policy tools is quite different in Europe than in Japan. Mm -hmm. Now, we do ask quite a lot of monetary policy. Going back to the Great Depression and the deliberations of the New York Federal Reserve in 1928, they phrased the challenges quite well, I think. The United States at the time needed one monetary policy for Wall Street mm -hmm. and a different monetary policy for Main Street. Of course, everybody wants to support Main Street, Main Street or in the modern European language, SMEs. The problem is that money is created via the banking system, and therefore money either piles up in the reserve banks of the banks, in the reserve accounts of the banks, as the data I've looked at on the Japanese banks does show, the money is more likely to end up on Wall Street than on Main Street. And therefore, the impact of QE or QQE is very different when one has persistent deflation as in Japan, or when it's used to stimulate the economy uh, that already has inflation as the case is in Europe and the United States. Here in Europe, mm. the SMEs are simultaneously starved of liquidity while an unlimited amount of liquidity is fueling an asset price bubble. We here in Europe are hoping for a trickle down, for a trickle down effect. Now, one impact of the sharp increase is a sharp increase in income inequality, directly as a consequence of QE. And I do suspect that this, this, this increase in, in income inequality will become quite important in policy discussions in the years to come. QE, or QQE, mm. to use a recent US military terminology, is shock and awe applied to conventional monetary policy. Vast amounts of focused fire, money, applied to a small number of targets, the banks. 60 years ago, Milton Friedman proposed a different solution to the problem. Instead of QE, what if the governor of the central bank flies over the country dropping dollar bills? A pre-crisis, one governor was sometimes nicknamed a helicopter ban. <laughs> now, in this country, the amount of QE is 6,000 pounds per person. Would it have been more fair as well as more effective in stimulating the economy and generating inflation if the Bank of England had just sent an envelope with 6,000 pounds worth of 20 pound notes to every person in the United Kingdom. Now, to conclude, there are many lessons to be learned from Japan, one correct and one some incorrect. I think one of the most fantastic lessons is exactly what the governor mentioned. This is how to avoid unemployment. 
Another important lesson is the importance of acting decisively when implementing monetary policy. Thank you, John. Uh, Governor, would you like to mm -hmm. have the first right of reply, then we'll open mm -hmm. up to the audience. Uh, of course, um, I, I almost uh, totally agree uh, with, uh, with him, um, particularly uh, uh, the difference between uh, US and Europe on the one hand and Japan on the other hand. In the US and Europe, inflation expectations are uh, fairly well anchored around uh, 2%, um, which is, uh, which is uh, basically their uh, inflation target. Although the ECB says that uh, uh, price stability is defined uh, 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 to be um, below 2%, but close to 2% or something like that. But uh, I think um, uh, as a general matter, the, uh, their target are quite similar. And uh, the most important thing is their inflation expectations are well anchored around their target. On the other hand, in Japan, inflation expectations uh, had been well anchored around zero or minus. And we intend to raise uh, inflation expectations from there to around uh, 2%. Um, and uh, and uh, though the QQE in uh, its uh, uh, measures or tools uh, may be quite similar to uh, QE in the US or quantitative easing in the UK or some other non-conventional uh, monetary easing measures uh, uh, in the Eurozone, but the context is quite different. Uh, uh, we in Japan aim at raising uh, inflation expectations from uh, around zero to <coughs> two percent, while in Europe and, and the U.S., uh, inflation expectations were anchored around two percent, should be kept as they are, while adopting uh, QEs or some unconventional measures. They intend to stimulate the economy. Uh, uh, facilitate uh, economic recovery uh, from uh, the recession after the Lehman shock. So I, 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 I totally agree. And also, uh, asset prices uh, must be uh, always uh, carefully monitored. Although at this stage, uh, we don't see any sign of uh, asset bubble or anything like that uh, in Japan. But uh, we certainly have to uh, carefully monitor asset market development. And, uh, and the inequality issue, it's of course, uh, it's, uh, it's not an issue to be dealt with by the central bank, but uh, by the government, but certainly uh, uh, all of us uh, must uh, uh, continue to be uh, careful about the development in income uh, <coughs> equality or inequality uh, uh, happening in, in, in the past uh, 15 years or so and likely to continue in the next uh, uh, several years. I just uh, would like to mention uh, about uh, helicopter money. <laughs> I think it is a combination of uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. It's not pure monetary policy because uh, uh, distributing uh, money uh, without any uh, <coughs> uh, 
compensation or anything like that is is just uh, just uh, uh, fiscal policy. But uh, since that is uh, completely financed by the central bank, it's, uh, it's also the monetary policy. So it's a combination of fiscal and monetary policy. It's not uh, uh, usual monetary policy, or it's not uh, even, uh, uh, it's not uh, uh, like uh, even the conventional monetary policy, which is uh, still monetary policy, not uh, fiscal policy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to open it up to the audience. There's a young man downstairs with a microphone. I can't, oh, there is a microphone upstairs. Um, please, if you could just, I know who you are, but if you could just say who you are and ask your question, please. Uh, my name is Sushil Badwani, Mr. Governor. First, I would want to begin by con congratulating you uh, on uh, the enormous progress you've made with QQ QQE. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I, did want to sort of probe this a little bit. Uh, having made significant progress, you, you've now got a situation where uh, the BOJ's expectations for inflation mm. uh, one and two years ahead are higher than private sector uh, expectations. Now, the BOJ's line, uh, so far as I can discern it, uh, is that our expectations will be valid so we will stick to our original QQE plan, and we don't need to depart from that plan at this stage. I just wondered whether that's actually an extremely risky thing to do, given your predicament. Mm -hmm. uh, if you turn out to be wrong, then not only will there be economic losses associated with that, mm -hmm but there will also be a credibility loss mm -hmm. uh, in the sense the private sector will worry about your forecast mm -hmm. having been wrong, and it'll make it more difficult for Japan to escape from the deflation trap. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you targeted private sector expectations and imparted more stimulus now, mm -hmm. preemptively, and if it turned out that actually your forecasts were right all along, <coughs> then you can use conventional monetary policy at that point. I mean, mm -hmm. we know uh, how easy it is to bring inflation back down. Mm -hmm. The difficulty is escaping an, a deflation trap. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me there's an important asymmetry mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, given how uh, aggressive you were last year, I'm a little surprised that mm -hmm. you know, you've become, uh, I might even use the word timid now. Uh, wi which, which does seem a bit out of mm. character. Uh, and a second very quick point on helicopter money. Of mm. course it's a combination of monetary and fiscal policy. You could argue so is QE, but we won't go there. Um, but the uh, great thing about helicopter money is it's so much more effective. Mm. You have much more assured effectiveness mm. uh, by using that combination mm. rather than just depressing long-term interest rates, which mm. are already so low. Mm. I mean, the stimulative effect of bringing JGB yields down mm. from 0.8 to 0.6 percent is minimal mm. compared to the stimulative effect of mailing the money out. On mm -hmm. um, the first point, um, uh, I tend to accept uh, your argument uh, concerning uh, Asymmetry. Uh, by the way, this is uh, also, I think, related to the discussion in the U.S. about uh, about uh, how to approach uh, the, the the two percent uh, in inflation target or goal. I mean, some argue that uh, the Fed should uh, uh, accept some overshooting and then gradually return to the 2% uh, inflation target or goal. Uh, it could uh, uh, avoid, as you said, the loss of uh, output and employment in that process. And also, if uh, uh, actually uh, uh, monetary policy uh, overshoot uh, uh, inflation target, 
then uh, whatever kind of uh, monetary tightening, conventional or <laughs> unconventional, can be quickly employed uh, to collect uh, higher than uh, target the inflation rate. Uh, that uh, that uh, kind of uh, symmetry uh, uh, exists, I think. But at the same time, uh, even uh, reaching uh, from below 2% target uh, is, uh, is such a big change, almost uh, uh, dramatic. Uh, the revolutionary change for many uh, households and firms. And if you uh, intend to, to overshoot to 3% or 4% and then uh, go down to 2%, that could make uh, our uh, policy more difficult to be accepted by uh, household and firms. Uh, uh, and so I think uh, while uh, accepting uh, the existence of some uh, symmetry, but uh, even in the US, uh, there are very few economists who argue for overshooting. Um, that means that, uh, that, uh, that uh, symmetry may exist, but uh, at the same time, there are some other risks uh, involved in such, uh, such a tactic or a strategy. And I think uh, in Japan, uh, there could be even uh, uh, larger kind of risk uh, related to such overshooting strategy. So I think uh, uh, I think it, it's uh, uh, more appropriate and, and prudent to achieve the target from below, and of course uh, that does not mean that uh, we should never go beyond two percent or something like that. But uh, we should aim at achieving two percent and maintain uh, around two percent uh, inflation and uh, and to. Uh, to create the environment where <coughs> inflation and expectations be anchored uh, around uh, the target level, 2%. Uh, by the way, the, there's always some difference uh, between uh, forecast by policy makers and forecast by market participants or private uh, uh, sector people. It's inevitable. Uh, of course, uh, policymakers focused are uh, focused, not uh, hope or some uh, unrealistic uh, kind of uh, uh, wish or hope. It's uh, it's uh, focused, but since uh, uh, since it's uh, focused by a policymaker with. Uh, uh, some policy tools to actually achieve that uh, that uh, focused uh, figure. Uh, there may be, uh, I mean, some uh, difference between focused by policymakers and and, um, and uh, focused by the private sector. And whether it's uh, dangerous or not. Uh, I'm not uh, quite sure, and uh, and uh, I mean, when we decided QQE uh, one year ago, we took into account two-stage uh, uh, consumption tax hike, and also we assumed some, uh, uh, of course. Uh, uh, improvement in the world economy and so on and so forth. And uh, we introduced the QQE and uh, in the last uh, 12 months, uh, basically we are on track, particularly 
on the way toward 2% uh, inflation. Uh, although I admit that there was some, uh, some uh, what shall I say, uh, something which were not expected or anticipated. For instance, domestic demand has been stronger than we expected, while external demand has been weaker than we expected. Uh, so there are some, uh, <coughs> the economy is economy, you, can, you, can, you cannot uh, forecast 100% uh, accurately, but on the whole we are on track and uh, we expect in the next uh, 12 months or so, uh, the economy will be on track. And as I said, if we detect any sign of uh, uh, economy derailing from that uh, 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 track, uh, we will adjust our monetary policy. And uh, I understand the FOMC meet uh, eight times a year. Um, Bank of Japan monetary policy uh, uh, committee meet 14 times a year, uh, more than once a month. And uh, so more than once a month, we uh, uh, analyze uh, all economic data and assess uh, the, 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 the current economic situation and, uh, and, uh, and the economic situation in the next uh, two to three years. And uh, and uh, as I said, if we uh, detect any uh, upward or downward uh, uh, risks uh, uh, likely to be realized, we can adjust our monetary policy uh, without any hesitation. So I, 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 I don't think it's, uh, it's uh, so appropriate to uh, take uh, uh, more than necessary, more than appropriate kind of uh, uh, monetary easing to overshoot and then uh, uh, approach from the above to 2%. Uh, that sort of uh, intentional uh, uh, strategy, uh, as I told you, may not be uh, quite appropriate. And anyway, uh, we will adjust our policy uh, uh, if necessary quickly. Um, so uh, the, 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 the the helicopter money uh, issue is it's it's of uh, course uh, <coughs> quite an in, quite an interesting issue. Uh, by the way, I mentioned the Takahashi economic policy. Uh, it consisted of three parts. One is, of course, uh, exit from the gold standard um, by sort of being, uh, depreciating the currency. Second, uh, very aggressive uh, fiscal policy, uh, substantial increase of public works expenditures. And third or, uh, part was uh, that uh, public expenditure increase was totally financed by the Bank of Japan credit. Uh, and it uh, certainly succeeded uh, in, uh, in uh, eradicating uh, deflation and uh, achieving uh, quite rapid economic recovery. Uh, economic historians in Japan, they were Somewhat divided. Some strongly recommend uh, or uh, or uh, appreciate and and uh, Takahashi uh, economic policy. Some others uh, uh, took more cautious uh, uh, stance, saying that uh, yes, during uh, Takahashi economic policy period, the economy recovered, but uh, then. Uh, when Finance Minister Takahashi tried to to uh, to uh, suspend um, expansionary fiscal policy, uh, seeing that inflation rate was rising, 
uh, finance minister was killed, <laughs> and uh, the whole uh, Takahashi economic policy was derailed. And uh, of course, uh, at that time, Japan was uh, engaged in um, war in Asia, and uh, things went uh, so badly. Uh, so uh, it's not uh, yet decide definitively assessed uh, by economic historian, but I myself uh, think that Takahashi economic policy was quite appropriate uh, in that time. Uh, although currently, uh, I mean, certainly uh, government uh, introduced fiscal stimulus measures initially, uh, but now uh, uh, fiscal consolidation has started with uh, consumption ha tax hike. Uh, our monetary policy is uh, certainly uh, quite, uh, quite expansionary, but uh, unlike uh, uh, Bank of Japan during the Takahashi economic policy <coughs> period, uh, Bank of Japan, we do not uh, underwrite uh, JGBs. We only purchase like uh, Fed or Bank of England. Uh, we only purchase uh, JGBs from the market as a way of, uh, of uh, monetary policy. So I think that's a bit different. We go to Lord mm. Turner and then perhaps take one from upstairs. Uh, dear Turner, uh, uh, <laughs> Governor Karuda, I can't uh, resist following up <laughs> Sushil's question, uh, particularly since I remember uh, last June when we met, you gave me a copy <laughs> of the biography of yeah. Takahashi because yeah. uh, you knew I might be interested in yeah. that. Uh, I think it's a bit difficult to criticise a man's policy because just when it had been successful, the military yeah. assassinated him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but my my question therefore I I yeah. is is a slightly different one yeah. which is it's about exit from your policy mm. and whether there ever will be an exit mm. because at one level mm. Japan is running a large mm. public deficit mm. you are buying JGBs yeah. if at the end of the day having mm. bought them mm. they stay permanently on your mm. balance sheet mm. um, that will amount effectively to a sort of post facto helicopter money without mm -hmm. ever having declared it in advance. Do we even need to ask that question? I mean, mm -hmm. uh, is it possible that these JGBs, having gone onto your balance sheet, will be there forever? Mm -hmm. Or do you think that we know mm -hmm. uh, that having gone on, they will be sold off at some stage? Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, we are only halfway. And, uh, and so at this stage, it's a bit premature to discuss about uh, exit from the uh, QQE, uh, how and when uh, we uh, exit uh, from the current uh, um, monetary policy. Uh, but uh, in a sort of uh, theoretical term, uh, like the Federal Reserve in the U.S. So you can imagine that uh, that uh, uh, you uh, keep uh, those assets uh, purchased from the market uh, uh, until they mature. Uh, that is one possibility. Uh, our QQE uh, envisages uh, uh, quite significant amount of uh, JGB purchase uh, uh, whose uh, average maturity would be about seven years. Uh, since we have some uh, JGBs uh, uh, purchased before QQE was uh, introduced and uh, uh, their average, average maturity is much shorter, so um, 
At this moment, uh, the uh, average uh, remaining maturity of JGBs held by the Bank of Japan is uh, probably much shorter than seven years. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, how and when we uh, exit from the QQE uh, is, uh, is, uh, is, as I said, a bit uh, premature to discuss in concrete terms. But uh, I like the Federal Reserve. We have a number of uh, options or tools to deal with, uh, other than selling uh, uh, assets uh, acquired, purchased uh, uh, by us. But that does not mean that uh, we would never sell. <laughs> there are many options, many ways to deal with uh, the uh, exit and, uh, and what uh, kind of uh, exit uh, strategies uh, would be uh, uh, employed uh, would uh, very much depend on the economic and financial situations when we actually start to exit or tapering or whatever. Thank you. I've been, I'm terribly sorry, but I've been advised by John that we really do need to start the next session on time. Mm. So just before I offer a formal vote of thanks to the governor, um, there are three things that I need to alert you to. Um, firstly, that you're all very welcome to stay for uh, a drinks reception in the atrium uh, behind the old theatre, and that will start at 7 o'clock. Uh, I've also been asked to say that the Asia Research Centre, Stickard, and the Department of Economics here are sponsoring a public lecture next Tuesday at ah. 6.30 in the Hong Kong Lecture Theatre mm -hmm. by Professor Motoshiga Ito on the topic, Why Abenomics Matters, Abenomics <laughs> and the Japanese Economy. I'm not sure if you're able to stay for that, <laughs> Governor, next Tuesday. I doubt it. Um, <laughs> just before I vacate the stage as well, I should say that the next session will be chaired by uh, my colleague Ron Anderson. The discussant will be Jean-Pierre Zigrand, and we look forward then to hearing from Richard Fisher, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, on the very interesting topic of forward guidance, whether it's the FAD or the future of monetary policy. So that will start <laughs> on time at uh, quarter to six. It just remains for me to say once again uh, what a great <laughs> pleasure it's been uh, for LSE to host you today and to listen to you, to have many distinguished colleagues, I should say, as well, who I met last night, uh, from Japan. Thank you, John, for being the discussant. Thanks very much indeed, Governor Kuroda. Thank, Thank you. you.